All right. Well, thank you all for joining us for another of the million episodes of Closing Bell, where we're trying to talk about how um, the coronavirus pandemic has affected, is affecting the supply chain. Um, we've got a special guest today uh, that I will let Trey introduce in a minute. But before, so to keep you guys in suspense of that special guest, Trey, why don't you tell us uh, all of the major news that has happened since we last talked? Uh, I'm not going to lie. I'm getting tired of talking about major news within a week. I, I really <laughs> missed when there was like one story that we could think about, but now it's sure like enough. 90. Um, but the one that, that really I think is, is stuck in everybody's cries is, is what's going on with meat right now. So uh, the, the, the big one that I think really started pushing the, the, the media cycle forward was when the, uh, the Tyson CEO ran a full page ad in, I think it's the New York Times, Washington Post, maybe USA Today as well, but a, a handful of places saying, and the quote was just jarring, the food supply chain is breaking. Um, and so since then, uh, the Trump administration has uh, issued an executive order, which is being enforced by the USDA. Um, and at the same time, uh, as we are moving forward, even past the executive order, we're seeing more and more workers in certain places get sick because of this, uh, while certain animals are being euthanized within, uh, within the hog and beef supply chains, especially. Um, there's a little bit on poultry, too, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you know, and, and there have been the, the second day stories along with that, you know, so here's an article that I thought was a really nice take um, about a, basically that, that he's not quite right by saying that it's breaking, but more that it's flexing. Um, but, you know, we, we're trying to keep up with this stuff. And, and I believe it or not, it's, it's not like we have all of the answers um, as much as Schaefer likes to pretend that he does. Um, so we, uh, we thought what would be best is to reach out to the person who uh, is supposed to know all the answers, apparently, if you were to pay attention to the news. Um, so, so, so Jason actually is, um, he's very famous. Uh, you probably already know who he is. Uh, you know, this was, this is just in the last like two days. He's been in the New York Times. He was on the front page of USA Today. And if you don't think that any of those news sources are legitimate, um, here's an article um, out of Drovers that was literally talking about a lot of the same thing. Um, so, you know, Popular media, yeah, that's great. Uh, but but what I think is even more valuable for the conversation that we're having is uh, is his work on kind of the future of food. So uh, so Jason published a book three years ago, four years ago, maybe um, called Unnaturally Delicious. Um, um, it's up here in the corner of the screen. Uh, it's a fantastic read, and it's it's really kind of a series of chapters that just describes different ways that people are trying to interview, innovate through problems. Now, obviously, the problems was the word pandemic in your book at all, Jason? I, I don't remember, but I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, three months ago, I didn't really know the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic. So <laughs> I'm, we're all learning, but, um, but, you know, Jason's been thinking about kind of how the, the future of innovation looks like in agriculture. That's a topic that we keep getting in terms of questions from the audience. Um, so, so we thought we could bring Jason on. You know, he's also, um, if you like TED Talks, he's done like, like 40. Um, so, so you can watch some TED Talks in there. This is a photo from one that he did a couple years ago about uh, poultry production and animal welfare. Um, but perhaps most importantly, and this is my, my promotion. So uh, well, Jason was my advisor at Oklahoma State, uh, my Oklahoma State hat and my uh, Barry Sanders cup. Um, and uh, while we were there, we were a part of a very good basketball team. Uh, we, we were the, the grumpy old men. Uh, just so Jason, he's won like the, the Cast Communication Award, the, the Borlaug Communication Award, you know, he's won all these awards, but per, perhaps most importantly, he was the starting uh, small forward for our intramural team, uh, and, and we actually made it pretty deep into the Sweet 16 of the playoffs one time, so, um, so I've known Jason for a long time, and, and we're really thrilled to have him on to, to kind of talk through some of this stuff with us. Well, good. Uh, it's uh, it's great to be here, and kudos to you and Alex for uh, you know jumping on this moment. I've listened into a couple of y'all's podcasts. It's been fun, um, and or not podcasts, but this, these webinars. And so it's been great, uh, and it, it's uh, it, it's fun to be on here. And uh, I think uh, if our team was a grumpy old man, I was the oldest and maybe the grumpiest. Um, <laughs> Trey was like the young dude that was pushing everybody around. We just throw him the ball, you know, it's like try to get Trey the ball and he'd elbow somebody and, and make some shots. Um, 
So I can't claim to have anything to do with our success, but no, I, but seriously, I think I really appreciate what you all have been doing, um, you know, and trying to make, make people more informed and help us think through these things in a, in a more logical and consistent economical way than, you know, than you read in some of these headlines, unfortunately. And yeah. so then maybe uh, as much as I'd like to hear more about Trey's braggy basketball days, uh, maybe we can ask you <laughs> the, the second most important question, which is, I mean, you're the guy for, for meat. Uh, is, is Tyson right here? Is, is the food supply chain breaking? You know, I, um, I think that USA Today title, I think that opening quote is from me. I, I and I think, uh, I, I can't remember if this is the one in that article or not. They're all kind of running together. But the food supply is not breaking. The meat supply is under a lot of strain and stress at the moment. And um, so I think it kind of just depends how um, you know, one wants to think about our food system. But there, there's no doubt the meat system's under some very serious stress and struggle at the moment. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe we jump into a few of these slides and then sure. talk about the food system more mm -hmm. broadly. Um, I didn't put anything in here about the future of food tray. Uh, we can, but we can talk about those things. Maybe we'll talk about the more immediate and then we, then we can talk about the future a little bit. Right, right. But I think for folks that aren't all that, you know, familiar with the meat sector, you know, that to understand what's happening in this moment, I think you have to really understand how concentrated the sector is. So this map I put together sh shows you the, the red dots there are the 15 largest pork packing plants. And that's a, those 15 red dots um, slaughter 60% of all hogs, roughly. You can see two of them there in Indiana that are, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes from me. Uh, there's, a, there's a plant, Coldwater, Michigan, which uh, would be about the 16th largest. So I didn't get that dot on, on here, but um, it's actually one of the newest plants. And we could talk about it in just a minute because I think it's, it's kind of instructive. The blue dots are the beef plants. Um, so in, in there, it's even more concentrated. So that the top 10 plants do six, you know, a little over 60% of all production. So even from you know, back in early March, when I saw you know, a lot of the disruptions in the food supply chain, I always had a pretty optimistic view that we were gonna, you know, it's kind of peak stocking out, we'll work through this, it's gonna be okay. But even then, I, I had a sense that our vulnerabilities were gonna be in meat packing. I think I even wrote that at the beginning, near the beginning of March because these are plants where you have several thousand, a couple, at least two or three, four, sometimes 4,000 workers in a plant. I've been in several of these plants, they're working shoulder to shoulder, and it just struck me, hey, if one of these people gets sick, it's gonna spread in this environment, it's a refrigerated environment. And because each one of these plants, each one of those dots up there, you know, is anywhere from three to, you know, in some cases, 6% of total US uh, processing capacity, you lose one, it's enough to make a dent. Mm. And that's sort of what we've started seeing. So I think to, to understand the challenges with the sector, you got to kind of understand the, the concentrated nature of it. This, this figure alone, I think, I don't think people really think about food this way, that like there are certain parts of the country that do a lot of one thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, like I, I, I just don't think, I think we, like you might see a beef cow somewhere in Montana and you're like, okay, so most of the beef cattle production probably is in Montana. But there is this distribution across it that I think is just absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, you, you draw yeah, a circle cool. around Des Moines, Iowa, about 200 miles, and that's 11 of those pl pork plants are in that circle. That's and you crazy. Do the same, and you do the same thing around Wichita, and you're roughly, you know, rough or Dodge City, and, and you got most, almost all the beef plants. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one upside of that in this kind of pandemic is when a plant shut down, you don't have to go that far to find a, another mm -hmm. big one. Uh, but at the same time, it also shows that there's, you know, uh, you know, look at that North Carolina plant. That's actually the biggest uh, pork processing plant. It's about six or seven percent. What if that one goes down? That, those animals got to move a long way to find a home. OK, so so these these producers are thinking like, oh, my gosh, like this stuff's coming down. And even Tyson saying this stuff's breaking. Are they thinking we need to diversify? We need to make smaller plants all over the place? Or are they still thinking that? kind of uh, automation is, is the, the way forward? Well, of course, that depends who you talk to. <laughs> I mean, my view is that, that this is gonna push us towards a lot more automation. And that, that's actually where the cold water plant comes in. It's one of the newest pork plants. I haven't been through it, but I've heard people talk about it and I've seen some pictures. 
that plant actually has a lot more automation. And as, I, as far as I know, it's still up and running at the moment. And I don't know, I mean, this is all speculative at this point, is, is that because they don't have the, the labor needs that some of these other older plants have a need. So I, I see I see someone in the chat room saying, yes, it is. So there, there we go. Um, so I, I do think uh, automation it will be a, a, a the way the industry chooses to respond to a lot of this. Now, one question is, could we have more, um, should we give up some economies of scale? So let me, let me go on a little riff here and maybe I'll get on yeah. a, a pedestal and y'all can uh, knock <laughs> me off. But uh, maybe I'll start with the argument. Like a lot of people, so what's happening now is, um, as we'll see in some slides in a minute, you know, we're down about 40% in processing capacity at the moment. And particularly in the hog side, that's really backing up hogs. And, and you know, what do we do with all these animals? And sometimes I think people that aren't really familiar with the structure of this industry have some pretty naive views. They're like, why don't you just send this to your local butcher? Yeah. Um, so you just take those two plants that are there in Indiana. Each one of those plants can do more than 15,000 hogs a day. You know, every single day. Uh, now they don't normally it's work. A lot of local butchers. Exactly. So That's just right. just as like, you know, as, uh, you know, so as a, total industry perspective, we have total processing capacity of about 500,000 pigs a day. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're down about 40%. So that's uh, 200,000 pigs a day that we're not processing that would have been processed otherwise. So, you know, we don't run for, we, we run at that for a week, which is roughly what we've been doing. That's a million extra pigs that we're going to go to market that didn't. What are we going to do with those? So, you know, again, back to this like local butcher thing, people think, uh, even if you had a relatively, you know, large, small butcher that, let's say, for easy math, could do 200 pigs a day, that plant would need to run 100 extra days to make up for or essentially one of these large plants going down. Mm -hmm. Or the other way to think about it is instead of 100 extra days, you need 100 small butchers <laughs> to make up for the shutdown of one of these plants. And so, yes, I mean, I do think that even if you're working for Tyson or JBS, you know, I would, if I'm working for those, one of those organizations and I'm looking at the future, I might think maybe we need to give up some economies of scale and maybe build some medium-ish sized plants um, to spread that out this risk for, uh, that, that's coming down if our workforce goes down. But even, even still, um, this scale issue is a, is, is a real, it's not easy to, it doesn't go away, you know. Okay, so so then contrast that with poultry a little bit, because you know from what I've read, poultry seems to be doing uh, at least fairly better uh, in terms of uh, shutdowns and production. I think that that's why, right from I, what I've read, and just to be honest, Trey, I don't know as much about that okay. industry, um, so I can't speak as much about why it seems to have been less vulnerable to this. And I don't know if it's because there are more kind of more mediumish sized plants. I don't know if it's you know, there is more automation that happens in some of those plants. Uh, it's just less, it, I just, I just don't know. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But if you know, or you have some speculation, I'd love to hear it. No, I, I mean, I really don't. I, I think, uh, you know, one, one thing that I, I kind of, it's maybe one of those, if ever, the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, two of my first two moves are, are like behavioral and then regulatory constraints. But like everything, it sounds like you're talking about, and, and from what I've read, it's, it's not really like the panic buying exists, but it's not really that's the problem. Uh, and then the, the regulatory side matters, but it's this economy of scale thing that matters more. So even though like Wyoming is starting to move toward, you know, uh, allowing butchers to, I think, operate on a smaller scale, I think. Um, and it's still not clear to me that it, that's really the solution. But I do wonder about substitution of poultry because it does, from what I've read, it doesn't, I mean, poultry has been affected, but not nearly like pork. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's a good question to, to try to figure out in the future. Um, yeah. So I thought I, I just would have some shameless self-promotion here. Sure. And um, as I was, I was sitting in a meeting with, um, you know, a bunch of folks on campus here the other day, we were talking about this problem. My dean, my president have been getting a lot of calls about what's happening in the food system. And so um, I was describing it and our head of agricultural communications here at Purdue, she said, I, I mentioned the word, well, it's kind of like a bottleneck. It's an hourglass shape. And she said, wait, can you do a, 
you know, can we write a little like Q&A and can we create a infographic? So um, there's, this is actually an animated graphic. So if you go to that link, it, you know, there's some stats that come up and I think it does help actually illustrate not just, you know, meat, but for a lot of um, sectors, dairy would be this way too, that you have a lot of farms, but all of them have to go through a, a much more concentrated processing sector. Um, so at that link up there too, there's just, it's, it's a bunch of q and A. I I asked myself questions and answered them. <laughs> I'm like, why are we dumping milk on the farm? But there's, uh, but there's not milk in the grocery store. Like those kinds of questions are kind of at that, that link. I mean, it's super good content. And, and it's, I mean, the hard part I think is that, that you have a lot of people who are used to understanding agriculture and then you have a lot of people who aren't. Mm -hmm. So um, the, what was nice about this piece is that, that you actually really are talking to the people who have no idea what is going on. Yeah. The other, the one really cool piece of this animation, you know, some of those little buildings down there, like the airport, like when the trucks are leaving the, the plant, uh, like a roadblock comes up to the airport, you know, like they're not buying food anymore. So, you're like, you know, even though we can, so, and it gets to your point, Trey, this, I think people view this meat packing crisis as it's somehow like the same as what was happening and when our grocery stores were stocking out in mid March, mm. late March, but it's different. I mean, yeah. that, that was caused by an entirely different phenomenon, this sort of disruption from food away from home to food at home and all that. Um, so, but can I ask you a, a question about that, Jason, in your bottleneck there? The, the fact that we've talked about the, the big shift from food away from home to food at home, and you've got all these different uh, routes here. Uh, on that side of the argument, to what extent is there a substitution from airport where you're saying there's a roadblock yeah. to grocery store? Some, but not as, it's not as easy as you might think, or the, the sort of naive view. Well, okay, I'm sending, let's just pick eggs, uh, for example. Um, you know, restaurants take eggs, grocery stores take eggs, just ship them over there, right? Mm -hmm. Well, first there are regulatory problems that prevent that. So once eggs were labeled to go, uh, were packaged in a way to sell for a restaurant, you couldn't then resell them to a grocery store. There are federal laws that prevented that. Now they've relaxed those some, but the other issue is, you know, eggs get sent to restaurants in one of, typically one of two forms, either uh, liquid eggs, yeah. so they're already broken um, and they're big buckets, or on um, big pallets. And sometimes you see these in a grocery store, but um, like those egg, uh, like those foam egg things that, you know, you sometimes put under your mattress, like it looks like that uh, with actual eggs in there. Mm -hmm. um, and so even though, even the egg producers, some of these egg houses are, designed to deliver directly, you know, to restaurants. So there, there, you may have a whole facility that's a, that's a breaker egg facility that's going into liquid eggs. They don't have, you know, like dozen cartons sitting around to put into your grocery store. And that, that actually was a problem. You know, there weren't enough styrofoam and cardboard cartons to put the eggs in, in the way that we buy them in the grocery store. So that, you know, I don't, I, I don't think I put a graph in here, the egg prices, but you know, egg prices increased about 300% they're in mid-March. Now they've come almost all the way back down. Yeah. And part of that is because we've, we've worked through that bottleneck that's there. And then that same story has like played itself out. The details and the particulars are, are different. I think, you know, my favorite one there is the toilet paper um, sure. example, because you think about, well, I think probably two things. One, we probably don't think about how much toilet paper we use away from home, um, <laughs> but, but we use a lot. Mm. And so all of a sudden we just needed a lot more toilet paper at home because we're at home a lot more often. And then just think about it when you use toilet paper, you know, in your office or in a restaurant, it's in those huge rolls, you know, and the plants that make those huge rolls are not the same as the, the plants that make the little small, you know, Charmin soft, uh, so soft rolls that we're used to at home. And so, yeah, I mean, if things got really bad for a long enough period of time, sure, you and I buy a big 50, you know, gallon drum of uh what not gallon i don't know what, what units of uh toilet paper I buy in gallons in, but, of toilet paper personally yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. pounds yeah <laughs> sure we would we would do that if things got really dire but you know in the heat of the moment in the you know a few days or weeks time you know that the supply chains just weren't configured for us to buy those huge okay you know, huge rolls. So, so so let me let me think this through then because the the problem that i i mean people are talking about is like well everybody's still eating it's not like like people are just not eating anymore. So so in what world does it make sense that like like demand has stayed the same and yet the the supply has taken such a hit? I I, I don't think that's true, but I I, I would 
like to to hear uh, at least your take on on how that that doesn't really work out that way. Yeah, well, maybe just so people see know what we're looking on this graph. This is just total cattle slaughter, and you can see yeah. really about the beginning of April we started to drop off. So the last few days we've been running at about 40% lower than where we were last year. And, and some of that's because of plant shutdowns. Um, uh, and a lot of that is to, due to plant slowdowns. So I think we had a question I noticed in the chat already about Trump's order. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, I don't, I think, I've talked to a lot of people, nobody really knows exactly what it means yet. Um, yeah. But I think even if you can order a plant to stay open, it doesn't mean the workers will show up. Um, and even if they do, they're not gonna, if they're social distancing, that plant's gonna be running at much lower capacity. And that, that's what we're seeing a lot of cases in, in beef. You know, it's not like, if you just look at the number of plants shut down, it's not 40% lower capacity. It's that a lot of the ones that are open are running lower. So, you know, this is almost, in, this reduction in, in, in processing capacity is almost entirely though due to the COVID issue. Worker, you know, the plants are not able to operate at full capacity. They're either shut down or slow down. So that's the supply side. So it's a completely different story then. Like the this yeah. the shift in demand is, doesn't really even matter to, to what's going on in shortages. Yeah. So I thought, I, actually, Trey, I thought about sending you this graph and I didn't. Uh, maybe I should have since you're asking the question. But I, uh, if an, another shameless self-promotion, you can go to my blog, which is just my name, uh, jasonlust.com. Yesterday, I put up a graph where we can we can make some calculations to, to help us infer what's happening to both demand and supply. And in, indeed, if you look at the you know middle to late March, demand was rising because we were all trying to buy a lot to stock up in our freezers and take home. Then demand fell, and then for whatever reason, at least for beef, the data seemed to suggest that demand is rising again which is a little surprising because my, my overall sense is that because of the turning off of food away from home, or at least turning down the dial a lot, that, that aggregate demand, you know, probably was down a little bit, but at least the data I showed the other day is it may be, it, it, you know, it's, it's still, you know, um, at least on pork, it's still probably the case that aggregate demand is still lower, probably because of food away from home being turned off. Well, but, but that gets to something that I, I don't want I hate jumping, but, but this yeah. is this is what I think of immediately. So so like the way we talk about pork demand or meat demand is, is kind of unfair, right? Like like bacon demand is not the same thing as ham demand, right? Yeah. So I, um, I think this is really interesting to watch. I'm I'm uh, I'm hopeful somebody some academic out there will write a paper about this. Um, but uh, I, I didn't get time to update this graph. But I think it just shows as the title on here says, not all meat is the same. And so this is just a change in, in wholesale um, primal cut prices going back relative to the beginning of March. And what you see is that, you know, round and chuck prices increased over this time, kind of leveled off, but then loin and short place plate prices fell. Now, why would that happen? Well, round mainly goes to producing ground beef. Chuck is a lot of roast, but you can, you know, the price point is such you can easily convert to round. So that tells me, um, you know, the, where the demand was, was for the relatively inexpensive parts of, of the, of the animal, uh, that could be converted to round. It also tells us what we at home are comfortable cooking, uh, easily. And, and it's also the, the price point issue. It's just a cheap, it's just a cheaper part. Whereas, you know, the other aspect to this is loins. Uh, and this is the thing I want some academic to write a paper on is, can you back, use these data to back out what share of these products was going to food at home versus food away from home? Ah. Um, that that's the thing I think it obviously that's in there <laughs> because I think loins probably a larger share of that was going to food away from home and that's why we saw that you know the, we didn't see that respond nearly as much and then the other other piece of course is just the price point it's just more expensive the mm -hmm. short plate by the way that's where briskets come from also uh, uh, the skirt steaks that are in fajitas so these, you know, think of your barbecue restaurants, your Mexican food restaurants, uh, you know, I don't know, but I'm speculating that's why we didn't, we saw those, those cuts respond that way. But so based on this, like if there is this shutdown of, of, uh, or slowdown of, of beef production and, and pork production, like it, to me that, that says like, it's not going to affect all of these things the same way. Right. Mm -hmm. So like yeah. at some point the, the, the ground beef demand is what really is going to be driving things because people are shopping at, at the grocery stores. 
Well, right? it will. It will roughly. And the price affects, will increase. Yeah, it will rough, and so that's why I wish I would update this because I suspect in the last few days all of the prices have increased. Uh, yeah. I don't know, but um, but one thing we actually the supply of all of them probably has been affected roughly the same because every cow has four legs, a tail, and a nose. Yep. Yeah. Um, which uh, which is but, why. This yeah, is <laughs> but what hey, what is different potentially is de the demands are really different from those. Also, beef is you know that's interesting because you know you you could you can take steaks and turn them into ground beef. You can't take ground beef and turn it into a steak. So there's this kind of asymmetry in you know product conversion. Um, this is just hogs. It's basically showing the same thing that we've really fallen off. Those little dips right there. This is the problem with dealing with daily numbers. Those are Easter, ah. so they they close down on Friday, Good Friday before Easter. Um, oh. Okay. And, well, and I, I didn't realize this when I first put out this graph. I had some emails from people that were like, you know, industry insiders were like, you idiot, you know, this, this is Easter. <laughs> it's not uh, whatever. And I didn't realize this, but Easter was on a different day last year. Yep. And you can see that uh, that Friday uh, that's there. Yeah, that dip. Jason, can I, ask, can I ask a question uh, about yeah. these plants? You're saying they're, uh, so the ones that reopen are the ones that are taking measures maybe that haven't been hit yet. Do you have a sense of uh, at what percent capacity they're operating given the social distancing? Uh, no, yeah, I mean, that's a good question, uh, Alex. And I don't know, actually, if somebody on here knows, I would love to hear. Um, but, it, you know, is it... 75 or is it 50? I, d I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, actually, you could probably do a back of the envelope calculation here. There, are, Right now, there are five pork plants shut down, and we know their capacity, and it's not, uh, so this is down about 40 percent, and it's not 40 percent, it's roughly 20 percent. So of the plants that are That's remaining hard. open, you know, you could probably do back out sort of what capacity they're running at. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the CDC releases document that says, all right, this is the, the protocols that people are supposed to follow if they're going to keep their plants open, right? Mm -hmm. um, do, do we have any sense of what those, like, what the CDC protocols would do to, to the capacity of these plants? I mean, that's kind of what I was trying to ask. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, the, the spacing, the, the spacing certainly will slow down. Yeah, the plant. and I don't, that's the part I don't know the exact numbers. But uh, one thing that it is doing is uh, I've noticed in my local grocery stores here in West Lafayette, I don't know if y'all have seen it, but um, a lot more meat in, in vacuum packaging and a lot more whole muscle cuts showing up. And that's a direct result of less labor. So most of the labor in these plants is in, you know, what you might call disassembly. Um, yeah. Taking, you know, big, those primals off the animal and then further breaking down those primals. And, um, and so if you don't have as many people in there, what you're gonna do is, is you know, package them much more, you know, whole, whole muscle. That's the other part of that too, is this, this whole food away from home. We send a lot of the stuff we send to restaurants is, is packaged in these much bulkier vacuum pack, package things. Um, so I don't know, have y'all seen that at your grocery stores or is that just me? I have not been to a grocery store in like a month. <laughs> but neither. I have no clue. Can, so can I, but can I ask a question? Um, exactly related to that which is if they are operating at some reduced capacity um, and we think about uh, the fact that demand for animal source proteins I guess we can say is roughly unchanged and so we may have some substitution among those things are there other like do you expect to see substitution from beef or pork towards something else uh, is there more flexibility in one of those supply chains with less bottlenecks that are able to adjust more rapidly? Yeah, I mean, it, do, it does appear for what reasons that we don't know, or that at least Trey and I don't know, <laughs> the chicken seems to be um, less affected. So you're right, just relative, it's going to happen through relative prices, um, that prices uh, reflect scarcity and prices serve to uh, scare, uh, ration scarce resources. So our, you know, uh, the, I, maybe we look at the next slide here, Trey. I, I think the prices are on here. Here's beef, yep. beef wholesale prices. Um, and you can see really since mid-April have been just taken off like crazy. In fact, that's about a 60% increase since uh, middle of April. Um, oh, so so that, is, these, these slides are fascinating to me because like, like I stole your, your data from your blog post like a week ago or two weeks ago. And, and you could see the bump, but you didn't see the takeoff. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so like, I, I had to update because like, it's a completely different story than it was like a week ago. <laughs> it is. Um, I know. 
Th that's been the amazing uh, um, thing here. So I'm going to answer Alex's uh, question, and then then maybe get back to this. So yeah. you know, so that uh, point we saw this is yesterday's price at the yesterday afternoon's wholesale box beef price. Uh, that's as high as we have seen in at least the record of the data set I have, which goes back about 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. So of course, people are going to cut back when prices rise to that kind of level. What are they going to substitute towards? Um, actually, pork overall, the level is cheaper. So even if prices are rising in pork, you may substitute to a pork. Chicken is definitely cheaper. Um, and that, you know, actually the story of meat over the last 30, 40 years is the rise of chicken. And yeah. people speculate as to why. Was it health concerns or whatever else? A big part of that substitution can be explained by the relative price changes. Chicken just got a lot cheaper over that time period. And how um, about the the responsiveness of quantity or, or the availability of chicken, say, uh, to this change? Are we able to increase our our supply of chicken? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, all, all, all these products have biological lags, but, mm -hmm. uh, but for chicken, it's certainly much uh, shorter. And they've been able to, uh, you know, kind of pull back you know, production more quickly. So the, you know, the typical broiler chicken that you and I eat in the grocery store um, is about six weeks old. So they can, uh, six to seven weeks old. Um, so they can, you know, they can turn that around much faster, you know, in, either increasing or decreasing. Right now they're, they're decreasing somewhat because of the, the slowdowns for them too. But their ability to be able to change and respond is, is on a much faster scale than the other proteins. Now, some people talk about other proteins that you might substitute towards eggs would be one. And, and what's and, um, the biological lag there? Uh, it's a little longer because you need to get hens that can get to the age to lay, lay eggs, but, um, but certainly faster than, you know, than certainly cattle. Um, but, but you think about the other proteins, like be beans, lentils, that's, that's an annual seasonal issue. <laughs> you know? So it's not like we're going to ramp up there. So that is one question I've asked is like, you know, sometimes the vegetarians that I'm friends with, you know, on social media, I've seen some of this and like, yeah, yeah like, good for us. I'm saying, you better watch out. You know, people you know, shifting away from these products towards other proteins are going to pull up prices. And so we actually got a, a question about that right now, which is, uh, what about demand for meat substitutes? Yeah, you know this is that uh, before COVID happened, which so now it's uh, COVID all day every day. Before that was pretty much plant-based meat all day every day. So it's yeah. like uh, from one topic to the other. Um, so still a very very small share of the market right now. But you know if what happened if the things that all these headlines are saying are going to happen which is you you, stu, you do start getting some limited availability some stocking out for me you may get people trying these plant-based alternatives that haven't done it before and you know maybe that makes some people more likely to try them again uh, maybe some people don't like them but i think um you know early on i saw some of the people in the kind of plant-based in you know industry commenting when this that little hump that's there with the beef um, you can see the same hump in terms of sales with uh plant-based and its percentage growth was huge you know it was like 160 percent but of course yeah, that's right. you know starting from a very very small base and i haven't seen updated data on that you know since we kind of gotten over that hump with everything else i'd, I'd be really curious to see that there was a what, story in the financial times like a week ago where they were saying like this just really shows the plant-based proteins are going to take off. But, but like, I mean, if you look at any of the sale, the IRI scanner data of, mm -hmm. of uh, grocery store sales, you just saw a hump there. Like it, it didn't really matter what the product was. It's, it's pretty consistent. Even if we were talking about the bread section. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, and I, I think probably in this next one too, eh, not so much on pork prices. What, so the one thing I'll say on the pork price side of things is, even though you see the same run up in prices, actually that increase from middle of April till the, uh, Till now is like seventy percent increase. You can wow. see we just barely got above last year's price, um, just now. Yeah. So I mean, in in terms of kind of relative to history, like like the current price doesn't seem is it is it that far off of what we would have expected, like modeling wise, so, or was it back in April on April 9th that that was actually the anomaly? Yeah. So beef is certainly an anomaly. Pork. Yeah. Um, you know, so the thing that was going on with pork is coming into this year, we had a really high inventory, a lot of pigs um, that, that were on feed. And a big part of that was we were expecting uh, to sell a lot more to China. 
So the African swine fever problem in China, they had to kill off about half their hog supply herd, which yeah. by the way is bigger than the whole US <laughs> hog wow. herd. And as a result, um, we know, and, and we thought trade, some of these trade tensions would, would settle down. And so we were really ramping up as an industry. The industry thought it was gonna be a really good, really profitable year. So some of this fact that prices are, you know, kind of, you know, holding a little lower than we were is because we had a lot more throughput already coming into this year. And in fact, you know, we have more cult, at least at the end of March, which is the last data we have, we have, you know, a lot more pork in cold storage at the end of March than we, we've had for the last uh, four or five years. Got it. I do Wait, think so though, yeah, go, go for it, Trey. We have more pork in cold storage. So that to me would mean that we should be less concerned about some type of meat shortage on pork, right? Should be, yeah, and um, and so to give you a sense of scale, there, there's about ten. If if we shut down every pork plant and every consume and prices didn't change and consumers just start kept consuming at the same rate, uh, we would have ten days roughly of pork in st in cold storage. All this, by the way, is private storage. It's not this. Is, there aren't like government strategic stores of pork as they have in China. Uh, it's all just commercial storage of people trying to, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, look for opportunities and that, that kind of stuff. The other thing to keep in mind here too that also mitigates against the shortage is trade. So over 20% of pork is exported. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could, we can, you know, a lot of those export markets are places that have been pretty hard hit by this virus, China, uh, South Korea, Japan. Um, and as a result, I think those, both the storage and trade are helping, you know, so far helping pork not get too out of whack on the, at least on this, consumer side. I think, I, I guess I've made this point to a lot of journalists because they want to talk about consumer shortages. I think, you know, that's yeah. fine to think about. I think most of the pain here is on the farm side, not the consumer side. Yeah. Well, well and it, that's something that is just kind of strange to me because people feel like, well, consumers are going to go, like, they're going to starve to death. But like, I, I, did you see the, the SNL sketch this last week about grocery stores? Uh, you know, I ha haven't actually seen it, but I've heard several people reference it. Well, so it's like a three minute sketch where they're like, you know, there are certain things that are stocked out, but, uh, you know, the, uh, um, what was it, like the sriracha flavored Oreos are fine. <laughs> uh, and so, so like, it's not like we're going to starve, right? Like it's, it's yeah, this, and that, that was one thing, you know, back in that, you know, problem. That, that first peak, you know, in, in mid to late March there, that's one thing I try to encourage people. Hey, all those pictures you see on Twitter of, of stocking out, look in the background. There's always, almost always food in some other aisle. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, it's just that your favorite brand or variety wasn't there and you just had to be a little more flexible, I think, with, and as, I think the same thing with regard to meat, you know, you may, there may be some limited availability, yeah. prices may rise, but, but you know, there will be some other options. One other, one other thing I'll say on that point too is, um, you know, hearing people in the grocery sector, uh, one of the things a lot of the food manufacturers have done and retailers have done is stops, you know, stop stocking the sriracha flavored um, <laughs> yeah. Oreos like just do do the the main the main thing you know and, and so yeah. they've really actually cut down on on the variety just to make sure that they're they're you know um, in these are in the food processing plants just getting out like the most popular things okay so but that's okay so now we're, we're at this meat point where it's like okay we're not it's not like we're gonna run out of protein it's just that you might have to consume the protein in a way that you're really not used to Fair. I, yeah, I, I, that's kind of the way I look at it. So, but can I ask the, the the point you made there was okay. So, on the consumer side of things, maybe it's not as dire as people are saying, and we've got this extra benefit that the the um, the meat source that's most uh, able to adapt in the short term is exactly luckily the meat source um, that hasn't been hit the hardest. So it's kind of good news over there. You said on the other end of stuff, uh, things potentially look really bad for farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder about the story you shared at the beginning, the concentration of the meat processing industry. Uh, some people have griped about that, but one of the potential arguments for the good uh, a benefit of that is that they have these incentives to ensure a long-term long source uh, of their products, so they're gonna they're going to um, try to protect or ensure the survival of their farms. Mm -hmm. Is there some of that story right now? Is that, I mean, is that a bright spot or is that uh, unrealistic? So I'm gonna 
answer a different question than the one you asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're like, Trey. Like, like, yeah, like any good, any good politician, that's, you know, that's what they do. Um, I'm going to answer a related question and hope you don't realize it wasn't the actual uh, question that you, you asked. Um, one is, so people uh, have made some analogies on the pork side to what happened in the late 90s when there were really severe, you know, drops in, in pork, pork prices in, um, you know, is this different? And one thing that is different is the pork industry is much more vertically integrated than it was then. Hmm. Um, I think about 40%, if I'm not mistaken, about 40% of hogs are produced on a production contract, which means actually that the, the farmer doesn't actually own the animal. They're getting paid for basically space. Um, so if you're in a production contract, depending on what the fine, you know, print says on that contract, you may not be that adversely affected at the moment. Um, so your exposure depends a lot on, on your relationship with the packers and that kind of stuff. Now on cattle, uh, much less of that sort of thing. And, and this gets maybe more directly to what you're asking. Um, you know, it's a pretty populist, uh, been a pretty populist moment, I think, in the cattle sector for a long time. And so this phenomenon is happening right now. We've been talking about increases in wholesale and retail prices. The thing we haven't shown is at the same time, livestock prices are falling. Mm -hmm. That that makes to me perfect sense from an economic standpoint that we have there's a disruption in the processing sector so that the meat packers can't move as many animals so their demand for livestock has fallen we can't we don't need as many there are too many animals relative to our ability to process them so livestock prices are going to fall at the same time I'm not able to produce meat less supply of meat on the market that's and that's going to drive up meat prices but. So I think from an economic span standpoint, the, the data we're seeing makes perfect sense to me. But if you're sitting there as a cattle producer, you're saying, hey, look, my price is falling, retail right. price is increasing, so, you know, I'm getting screwed. And um, I think just from a pure image standpoint, it, it, it you know, it, it, yes, it, it looks bad. But I think what you don't observe, so it looks like the margin for the packer is really increasing. Right. What you can't see is the packer's cost. Yeah. And you know, all this shutdown, slowdown, social distancing, installing panels and, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, that they're incurring an enormous amount of cost. So my you know, general sense is nobody is better off from this situation. Consumers are worse off because they're paying lower prices and not being able to buy as much. Uh, farmers are certainly worse off. Pay, they're not able to sell. Prices. The price, prices are Consumer, lower. Consumers are paying higher prices. Oh, right? sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Consumers paying higher prices. None of us like to pay higher prices. So we're worse right. off. Farmers are worse off. They're lower price for livestock. Um, and the packers, you know, I think this, you know, as, as you know, I'm not going to say there isn't or isn't is not market power or whatever, but I'm just saying by, they could have chosen to shut down any of these plants beforehand if they wanted to. The fact that they didn't and suggest to me they'd like these plants to be up and running. Um, and in fact, they seem to be working hard at doing it is, you know, their preference is to have the plant up and running. Um, so that tells me they're they're worse off too. You can actually look at stock prices of, of most of the, of the at least the publicly traded meat packers, and um, you know they haven't fared very well during this crisis either. They fell quite a bit during this you know middle to late March. Um, in the past few days, it's come up a little bit, but you know I don't get the sense they're a lot better off either. So you know we want a scapegoat to blame. If we want one of those, my view is it's the coronavirus. It's, you know, it's, um, yeah. Um, but I, I think coming out of this, there, there already was coming into this, um, you know, because of the, the plant fire we had in, in Kansas um, back in August, concerns about market concentration in this sector, and, and you know, this is just going to renew calls for that, and, and you know, the, I'll, the courts will work, settle that out. I'm not going to settle it here, um, but I'm saying the price changes we're seeing do not require there to be market power. Mm -hmm. There could be market power, but I'm saying that doesn't have to exist to see the price changes we're seeing. I don't yeah, care what. How is that about? How is that in terms of not answering your actual question? <laughs> but that's, no, you, you, know, you said things, though. <laughs> I, said, I said things. Yeah. The, the problem is, if if you talk to anybody on social media who who is kind of a, a on the ranching side of things or on the 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 animal production side of things, um, you know, the immediate response is that it's the processor's fault. Um, and, and, you know, that's almost across the board. That's like the first thing you hear. Um, but it, it, it does kind of strike me that like, yeah, if, if they had wanted to, they could have shut these plants down before and they would have, like, it's not clear they would have made more money then either. It's just, 
Um, but I, I feel like it's cold comfort, you know, I mean, like, like there, you have these, these producers who are losing their shirts right now. Um, and, and, you know, they, they are feeling the strain and I get that they want to like point the blame at somebody. It's, it's, it's hard to think that there are no winners here, but I, I think you're right that the, it's, everybody's losing. Um, but I do think it is, it's, it is probably fair to say that the livestock producer is losing the most. And I yeah. think that's, that's sort of the, and I, I think if I'm in their shoes, that, that is the injustice of it uh, from their, that they feel from their perspective is my, you know, I, I think point of view, but, um, you know, or my sense of things that this does get a little bit to, you know, something you mentioned a little while back about the structure of the industry and those kind of things is, you know, I've everywhere I've worked, there's always been some groundswell to try to build a, a packing plant in the state hmm. to, to deal with some of these margins. And it, sometimes that happens and often they don't fare very well. Um, so I think it's real. so economies of scale are really important. But at the same time, I do think it coming out of this, it's, it's useful to ask what are the barriers to entry in this sector? You know, in, you know, regulation is certainly one of them. Is it the major thing? I don't know that, but it certainly is a factor. You need a, you have to pay a federal inspector to be there at all times when you're operating. Uh, if you want to be able to ship across state lines and that that alone is a pretty significant barrier and so i think that's the way i think about these issues is you know let's make sure there aren't undue barriers to entry um, into these sectors is there are, are there so i like where you're you're going here are there other or, or is this the primary way to incentivize kind of resilience in these supply chains uh, in the future, is removing the barriers of entry mm -hmm. uh, in your mind the way to do it, or are there other ways to incentivize resilience? I mean, that that is sort of my preferred way. And you know, I think generally speaking, we think if if these people in the processing sector are earning excess profit, that is the incentive for new people to enter. Um, as long as there aren't these, you know, kind of legal barriers. By the way, I think one of the barriers that will prevent there from being more of these mid-sized packing plants, whether they're new startups or, uh, you know, one of the incumbents building a new plant is, you know, there aren't a lot of people that want a packing plant in their backyard. You know, yeah. I, I don't know, y'all probably read the stories about Costco trying to open up a chicken processing plant in Nebraska and the community really fighting back there. And so I think that that sort of the um, challenge here is I think a lot of the same folks who would say, um, we need to break up these packers, we need more small, small packing plants, or in many cases, some of the same groups that would say, but not in my backyard, <laughs> but put that, put that packing plant somewhere else. Um, I, I don't want that there. So that's another reason we see that concentration in many ways is um, look at those areas where those, particularly the beef plants are. There's not a lot of people in those areas. Yeah. So you think about if there are externalities, whether it's you know smell or wind or whatever, one way to minimize those externalities is to make sure there aren't pe many people around. And so that there is a sort of endogenous selection of location that goes along with, you know, the regulatory environment and then just sort of the socio-political environment. But Jason, I think you just, you just talked yourself out of the, the relaxing barriers of entry <laughs> as being the solution in that, yeah, yeah. In that answer, right? Yeah, well, no, exactly. I was, you know, so my preferred, you know, approaches to try to see what we can do to reduce barriers to entry. But one of those barriers is something that's really hard to change. That, that so I want to try to be realistic about how far we can get with some of that. So then is the, surely the answer isn't that there is no way to incentivize more resilience in the future <laughs> uh, well, by, by, from, from, from uh, policymakers. Oh, well, there are ways that are pretty draconian. I think they would, hmm. you know, it's, it's a research question, but how, how much, uh, what's the cost we're willing to pay for that resiliency is maybe one way to think about it. So, um, you know, you, you could have a Teddy Roosevelt, uh, you know, bake, break up the Packers, you know, law, uh, that could happen. I, and, um, you know, the, the question I would have is what is, what are, what's the cost of that to the system? So and, actually, I, I was when I asked the concentration yeah. question, I was I was taking the other side of things, which is the more um, whether I have market power or not, uh, the more uh, I my future supply depends on the existence of these farms, the more I'm incentivized to ensure the future existence of these farms. Mm -hmm. And so theoretically, if there is market power in these industries, the more mar market power you have, 
the more we're they're incentivized to look out for the the health of the of the survival of these farms in the future yeah or you know or a lot more vertical integration and coordination mm. um and it's been a lot hard it's harder just been a lot harder to do at beef cattle because you get beef cattle raised all over the united states and um and you, cause you need a large land base for that which is expensive uh maybe i'll shift gears for a minute and uh yeah. again more I'd say more shameless self-promotion, but at this point, I guess uh, I've promoted myself enough. It's not shameless anymore. <laughs> just, just promotion. Um, so one thing I'm working on, this is just a crude drawing, but I'm hopeful in the next week or two, I'm going to be able to release a, a tool on a website that I've been working with some people at Microsoft on to create you know, something that I'm calling a food and farm vulnerability index. And the, the basic idea is this, we have data on, um, COVID cases by county, and a lot of us have seen that, you know, reported in the news. You can go on websites and click on your county and see the number of COVID cases. What we also know is we have data on um, number of farms and also number of farm workers in each county. So we could take those two maps and we can have essentially an estimate of the expected number of farm workers that have COVID. By the way, if you do that, uh, I don't have the active version of it up here, but if you do that, um, those counties that have meat, meat packing plants, they're, they're, they're hot spots there. Mm -hmm. So the data is kind of showing up right. And what we can do is layer that on top of production of any commodity. Obviously production seasonal, all that kind of stuff, but putting that to the side, what you can do is combine all those things and essentially ask a question like, if you know the kind of labor productivity associated with producing say vegetables, and we know the number of COVID cases in that county, you know, ag worker COVID cases, at least an estimate of it, we can calculate a share of production that's at risk. So that's a little tool we're hoping to develop and in, in layer on, on you know, top of some of these discussions. And I put the vegetable one here because it's kind of interesting. You can see where all the potatoes are in Idaho uh, there. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, if you put, you know, it, but this does get to the question a little bit of you know, geographic concentration and some of that kind of stuff because, sure. um, you know, if you put beef cows, cows are everywhere, all of the United States. If you put broiler chickens, they're mainly in uh, Arkansas, um, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. Uh, so they're, you know, different commodities have different, um, different geographic distributions. And, um, and as a result, there are different vulnerabilities for different commodities. And obviously, this is a crude measure because it depends on when, when, you're har when you're planting, when you're harvesting. We don't have any of that temporal dimension in here, but I think it's a useful way to think about sort of rel you know, risk of, of, you know, to something like a pandemic. But I mean, even on the, the confirmed COVID cases, I mean, that's kind of the wild card too, right? I mean, it's yeah. not exactly <laughs> clear that we're measuring exactly where the COVID cases even are. Yeah, um, I, that's, that's right. I mean, there's, there's, uh, you know, it is a little frustrating actually even seeing a lot of the news reports of the stuff that the, a lot of the underlying data here is, a, you know, challenging. Yeah. What about, what about the production function itself where some of these uh, commodities are a lot more reliant on labor uh, yeah. than others? I wonder just even yeah. in vegetables, is there some kind of anecdotal story sure. about, uh, go for it. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd love to have data on that. Um, you're, you're exactly right. Just, you know, I, you know, from what I know about the industries, the, you know, amount of labor you need to produce, a, you know, a bushel of corn mm -hmm. is much lower than, you know, the amount of labor needed to produce some equivalent amount of, you know, I don't know, lettuce or tomatoes or something like that. Um, unfortunately, that, you know, we don't have great data, you know, what data we have from, say, uh, USD Ag Census, it can tell us the number of farms. Part of that's a joint production problem. There's a farm that could be producing multiple things, so we don't know how to allocate labor across those. Yeah. Um, so as we were starting to build up this tool, I was trying to figure out, can I get labor by commodity? That's, that data just doesn't really exist in good, good ways that were useful here. But I do agree with you, it is an important issue um, that would be a nice feature to add in here. So if I can get a finger, you know, to uh, get uh, a lot of money, I'll try to you know, dig up ah. data. <laughs> Speaking of, um, here was the chart of the day from the USDA. Uh, this is the average share of production that is uh, um, comprised by labor and harvest for selected crops. And it is, uh, so, so there is something there that I think, you know, is super interesting. 
Um, somebody actually just asked if there was going to be a produce specific um, closing bell, which I think the more, the more Jason you're talking, the more it sounds like we need to kind of dig into not just meat, but we also like almost have to have a different episode on, on produce. Right. Uh, so well, I, I agree. And, problems and, uh, on produce are going to be different, right? Oh yeah. And it's just, you know, I'm talking about meat because that's what I know, okay. <laughs> and, um, but you know, the, but it's a different story. And, I think from what I saw so after telling you it's something I don't know, I'm going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, you know, the, the challenges we're seeing in produce are very different. You know, that mm -hmm. you don't have the same labor in packing plant problems that you're seeing in meat. It's a different story, you know, that's, that's playing out there. Um, oh, dang it. I, oh, here it is. Okay. So this was one thing that I wanted to throw at you just to, to, to get your take on. Um, I don't know if you saw this article in Bloomberg the other day. Um, so this is uh, about renewable energy. And uh, so the, uh, the figure on the left is uh, the, the change in annual energy demand by, uh, by oil, coal, gas, nuclear, renewables. Um, and so the article itself is claiming that, uh, that renewables are the big winner here. Um, and then they, they show that the, in terms of percent change in emissions, we've seen this like record drop in, in the amount of emissions in the United States or is it just the US? I think it's, no, international, global emissions. Um, so Schaefer and I have been arguing about this a little bit because like I, I thought the in article was interesting and Schaefer's take was, well, no, oil prices, coal prices, gas prices are all coming down. So if anything, renewables are the big loser in this. Um, and uh, you know, what, one thing that sticks out is, you know, we still have a lot of livestock production, right? So like, like what, what's the deal with this record drop, even though the livestock production is still there? Um, I, I, I would just like to hear your, your kind of thoughts in real time. Yeah, so say that, say that last part again. Yeah, there were two different, Trey, there, you're talking about two different issues right now. What, one is uh, GHG emissions, yep. and the second is the future of uh, energy sources. Uh, and so the question that Trey asked is about that first, uh, production of GHG emissions. Uh, and so the figure on the right hand side is the, Trey has looked in this more than I have, but this is the predicted emissions per year, uh, or the change in emissions per year over time. And, and he's showing, or, or Bloomberg showing a huge drop in emissions in 2020. Uh, and Trey's saying, well, if uh, livestock accounts for a huge share of emissions in the U.S. and the amount of animals isn't going to change that much, why are we seeing this huge drop in emissions? Is that what yeah. you're saying, Trey? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I, exactly. I think, <laughs> I, I think this gets to the point that a lot of people in the livestock industry have made, which is, you know, if you look at EPA's numbers, for example, you know, it's mainly beef cattle because the numbers and they produce methane, which is a pretty potent greenhouse gas, but you know, it's still roughly 4% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, the, a, a, cha a change in the number of cars driving has a much bigger impact than a change in numbers of animals. I, I think that's partly what you're seeing in these data. Well, it just, to me, it, it, it starts pushing toward this, uh, this question of the future of, of food and agriculture, because I, for well, like you said before, uh, before COVID nineteen, everybody was talking about plant based proteins as being this way to curb emissions, uh, while simultaneously, uh, you know, providing some future that uh, allows us to step away from some of the the uh, non renewable sources. Um, but it it seems to me that at least with COVID nineteen, it's it's not clear that we're going to see that trend continue. Uh, that's my take. Yeah, I mean, the other thing to, you know, uh, I guess this, this graph doesn't have uh, biofuels in here, but I don't know if that's it, what's in renewables, but the course, ethanol the part. Is, there's big policy, you know, if you're, if there's a big drop in gasoline demand and you're, you know, we're requiring a bunch of that demand for biofuels is to blend with gasoline, you know, that's a big drop off in biofuel, biofuel demand at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that so so those are all reasons why if we're talking about that left hand panel there, they which has the headline renewables are the winners yeah. uh, in the decline in energy demand. I would, I, I I'm not sure that that's an accurate re, uh, reflection of the future. 
Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure either, <laughs> to be honest. I was I was kind of hoping that this would push you kind of more toward like talking about kind of your future thoughts on on uh, like where the the food and and uh, I don't know ag economy is moving. Uh, you know, ethanol I think for a long time people thought was going to be one of the big future movements, um, but it I don't know it, is that still in the mix? And and if that's in the mix, is also um, some of the other plant-based proteins, uh, more renewable energy source or uh, ag and food sources, are, are those also things that are in the mix or where do you think things are moving? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, obviously a lot of dynamics there. I mean, I think the sort of rise of digital agriculture is is there and the, and the use of more on-farm data kind of robotics, um, both in, you know, say fruit and vegetable harvesting um, and uh, the ability to, to, to make more, you know, precise decisions about uh, whether it's fertilized applications or seed, seeding and those kinds of things. I mean, that's already here now, but I think we're, we're moving much more in that kind of direction. Those things are probably going to continue to increase farm sizes because it enables, you know, one person to manage more, uh, more ground uh, because of the availability of those data um, to you know keep track of what's happening in all those places. Now I don't have a good sense of what you know sort of you know energy is not a sector I've spent a lot of time thinking uh, about and um, so I don't, I don't have a really good sense there. I mean, other than to say, uh, falling energy prices are generally good for farms <laughs> that need tractors and fertilizer. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's at least some good news while commodity prices are falling that maybe at least one of their input costs should should uh, be helped a little bit by some of this um, you know I, I do think you know if, if we want to speculate a little bit about kind of future you know what food might look like I do, I do think we already touched on this I think we will see a lot more automation in the food processing side of this thing and I think probably actually in the retailing side too hmm. and um, you know, already people have, you know, people that had never used a grocery store pickup service or the kind of Uber Eats or whatever. There's a lot more people that have tried those in the last, you know, last month than they ever have before. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the grocery store pickup uh, or even delivery, the way that's being done at the moment is they're still, you know, the stalkers are still going in the same store that you and I walk in to buy our groceries. But I think this is already happening a little bit. I think it'll further move in this direction. You may have these micro fulfillment centers that it's like a grocery store, except it's not for not for you to walk into. It's only for machines. Um, think about Amazon warehouses or something like that. It's to fulfill online orders. And uh, you know we may be buying a lot more of our food in that way that gets delivered to us in that fashion. If that's true, I could imagine. Now I'm really speculating. Um, I can imagine grocery stores that are a lot smaller we buy our packaged items through you know something meaning, that looks meaning grocery stores are a lot smaller meaning uh many more firms or just the on-site location is is a smaller uh, yeah location. i'm mainly thinking square just square footage of okay. the physical retail space okay. uh so they're, they're moving some of their space out to a warehouse somewhere okay um, yep. and so we're buy, we buy our packaged items from from online but most of us want to go pick out our meat and fresh fruits and vegetables in person <laughs> so maybe we have smaller stores square footage wise that we go and do that in um or maybe we go to more farmers markets or that kind of thing i don't i don't know but that, that's sort of some of how i see this playing out but a lot of it i think is getting back to this both cost of labor mm -hmm. and um and just the fact that labor now we know is vulnerable to the spread of diseases of course uh you know arguing against myself uh, a lot big, about to be a big unemployment rate, so there's going to be a lot more available labor than we've had in a long time. So, sure enough, yeah. that's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're, uh, we're think, running yep. out of time, but I will shamelessly promote for you. Here are the two books. Um, definitely buy either of them. This is the one that I think probably is is more relevant to the conversation that we're having right now um, about kind of what the future looks like. There's some like super weird topics in here including uh like uh like chefs that are all technology and automation where like like you have a robot basically that makes the food for you in your kitchen um and, and so like there's all kinds of strange stuff in here uh jason's book so naturally delicious so very much worth checking out uh if you haven't already but thank you so much for joining us 
really appreciate your, your insights. This has been extremely helpful, not just to me and Schaefer, but I think to everybody that's listening. Yeah, this was fun. Sometime I should come back on and let y'all talk more. <laughs> no, we'll probably do No, that. I like it how, how you're both me and Trey. You give the <laughs> argument and then you are, you talk yourself out of it. This is perfect. Yeah, that, that's right. If you just let me talk long <laughs> enough, I can convince myself of almost anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Jason. Really appreciate yeah. you on board. Thank you all. all right. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys.